Welcome back to Oil & Gas. So today we're going to talk about private ownership of oil and gas in the United States, why that's so different than the way that oil and gas is owned in the rest of the world, where generally the government owns the oil and gas that's under private owner's property. And we're going to talk about some of the effects that's had on the oil and gas system in the United States, as well as some exceptions, some areas where the government does own oil and gas in the United States. So first, in most of the world, in fact, almost all of the world, oil and gas is owned by the government, not the private landowner whose land sits on top of that oil of gas. And so it's very unique that in the United States, that oil and gas is owned typically by the private landowner. And so generally, oil and gas law in the United States is about private owners uh, working with private oil and gas companies to develop that land. Whereas in the rest of the world, if you're learning about oil and gas development, you're learn learning about the government negotiating with companies to extract that oil. So that has a lot of different impacts on the social and economic system surrounding energy in the US. One big difference is that we have very fragmented ownership. If you're in any other country in the world and you want to extract oil and gas, you think there's some oil and gas in a particular location, hey, go negotiate with the government, see if they'll let you extract it and make a profit from it. In the United States, uh, there is often very fragmented ownership. Not only are you gonna have to negotiate with a bunch of uh, random owners, and you might have to negotiate with several to get enough tracts of land together to develop oil and gas, but for any individual property, there may be lots of possible owners. And one reason for that is because we've known for a long time that there was potentially valuable oil and gas in the ground. And so as land has passed down over generations in a family, it may have gotten split up in different inheritances. And so at some point there may be 12, 16, 24 relatives all responsible for development of oil and gas on just what one tract, not to mention what happens if you have to negotiate with several. So you're often talking about many owners, you're often talking about small interests, and that means a lot of transactions. Just to develop a single oil and gas well, you need, may need agreements uh, with dozens of different owners. And so that leads to creativity. Those owners may have different goals in terms of whether they need money right away, money later, et cetera. And that may lead to some creative deal making, but that also means high transaction costs because it's not always the same deal every time. Uh, I'm, you know, the bad news is, of course, those transaction costs cost money. The good news for lawyers is those transaction costs are largely lawyers. So that's a lot of work for oil and gas lawyers. Now, in these negotiations, typically the oil and gas companies, the lessees, control the bargaining. Now, there are a lot of sophisticated lessors out there, so it's not always the case. But generally, the lessee, the oil and gas company, will have more experience with making oil and gas leases and other kinds of oil and gas agreements. And so sometimes they will drive the negotiation. Now, there's a lot of economic effects of private mineral ownership as well. One is that there's a lot of competition. There's competition among landowners to find an oil and gas company to come develop their land. Uh, but there's also competition between oil and gas companies to try and offer a better deal so that landowners will choose them to develop their land. Again, that leads to creativity where oil and gas companies are finding ways to offer better value while still ensuring a return for themselves. Um, and that can lead to a lot of efficiency in terms of finding the best deal. So one interesting thing is that even though US law is very idiosyncratic given that we have private ownership of oil and gas, often the kinds of deals that are discovered through creativity in the United States end up being used by governments abroad. There are governments who look at certain deals made by private U.S. landowners and think that's a good idea. I want to incorporate that in my government agreements with oil and gas companies. Now, competition has some downsides as well, which we'll talk about throughout the course. So one is you means uh, because of the rule of capture, which we'll learn about, sometimes there's a benefit to producing oil first. In fact, often there's a benefit to the landowner that's able to get the oil and gas developed first. 
and that can lead to a lot of drilling into the same reservoir, which can reduce reservoir pressure and mean less oil and gas is produced overall. And also sometimes you may just get all of the oil and gas produced at once when it might be more valuable if it was spread out over time and you didn't flood the market with a bunch of oil at once, but ensured a gradual production at reasonable prices. That can produce both economic waste where you're not getting as much for that, oil and gas as possible and physical waste where literally certain oil and gas cannot be used. You might have to just burn off natural gas if there's no market to send it to when that natural gas comes out of the well. Now, here's a picture of what that waste could look like back in the day. So this is actually a picture of Huntington Beach in California. For any of you who've been there, you probably don't remember it looking like this. But remember, this was developed in earlier days of oil and gas production when there were fewer limits on drilling lots of wells. And you can see there's a lot of waste in this picture because remember often an oil and gas reservoir it might be possible to produce it just using a few wells but if there's an incentive to just produce as much as you can as quickly as you can on your own land that can lead to a lot of wells puncturing the oil and gas reservoir which can reduce the pressure that brings the oil and gas to the surface and mean that ultimately less oil and gas is produced overall this is my favorite beach there in uh, near LA, which is the Venice Beach. Uh, for those of you who've been there, also looks a lot uh, different nowadays. But you can see how the competition in the private ownership of oil and gas has at times led to overdrilling, overproduction. So there are legal effects of private mineral ownership as well. One, of course, is because you have all these parties operating together. There are lots of deals and there are complicated deals. So there are often many disputes because because of that creativity, because every deal may use different language and the courts may interpret that differently. Uh, you're seeing a lot of time spent in lawsuits. And when those lawsuits reach the courts, sometimes the courts are going to interpret language that looks very similar in different ways, making distinctions between those lang that language. And sometimes it may seem that two decisions are simply uh, incompatible, but that is some of the complexity we deal with because of the creativity of the U.S. system. Companies count that litigation is part of their ordinary course of business. They know there are going to be some lawsuits. Now, I think over the course of the semester, you may think at times, wow, with all these possible lawsuits, with all of the time and money spent in court and with lawyers, how does anybody make a profit? But I think the thing to remember is, remember, the United States is and has been in the past the world's dominant oil industry. So clearly for all the costs that are imposed by the chaos of this system and at times the chaos of court and all the money spent on lawyers, nevertheless, the efficiency that's been found through experimentation, through creativity, through competition and trying everything has made the United States the world's energy superpower. And the other piece of good news for those of you who are studying law and becoming lawyers is that means there are a lot of lawyers and a lot of uh, jobs for lawyers as well. So in the United States, generally oil and gas is owned by private landowners because private landowners own most of the land in the U.S. and typically the oil and gas below your land, unless it's been severed from the surface, belongs to that surface owner. But the, U, the federal government and the state governments also own a lot of oil and gas, either because they own both the surface and the minerals or because they own just the minerals or in places like offshore development where that belongs to the federal government. So the federal government owns a significant, significant percentage of the total United States, mostly in the Western US, as we'll see, uh, but the states also own a significant amount. So in Texas, there's almost no federal land, but Texas owns a lot of land, at least for the purposes of oil and gas development, it owns the subsurface, the minerals, uh, as well as some offshore production. Now, historically, about a quarter of United States oil and gas production, a quarter or more, came from offshore production, even though most of U.S. offshore waters are off limits for oil and gas development. But just in the last 
10 years, there's been a surge of production from shale because a lot of that has been in Texas. A lot of that has been on private land. So the federal share of oil production fell down to about 20%. Just in recent years, it's driven back up to 26%. That's largely because of production in New Mexico. As I showed you in a previous class, New Mexico is now the number two state producing oil. And a lot of that production in New Mexico is on federal lands. Now you can see that a little bit here in the colored portions of this map show areas that are managed by the federal government. And what you can see here is that the majority, the vast majority of federal land is in the West. There's almost none in Texas, but just on the border between Texas and New Mexico, you see that on the Texas side, no federal land, lots of federal land on the New Mexico side. You can see the big uh, oil federal land managers here. Uh, you can see in pink, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in yellow, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, in light green, the Forest Service, all, uh, all having important roles in oil and gas development. Also, of course, uh, Indian tribes often have control over production uh, on their reservations, and there's a significant overlap of oil and gas resources, not just with a federal land, but also uh, with Indian lands. And you'll see those Indian reservations, uh, which are of course smaller than the um, tribal homelands, but you can see those Indian reservations in purple on this map and how they interact with oil and gas deposits across the United States. Finally, I'm gonna do a zoom in just so you can focus on that intersection between Texas and New Mexico where the Permian Basin is. And you can see how, uh, although the initial production mostly in Texas means a surge of production on private land and to a certain extent some state lands as well, in New Mexico you see that there's a lot of production in federal lands there and as New Mexico has risen in the ranks as an oil producing state, you've seen more production from the onshore federal lands. Of course, that's in addition to the offshore federal lands, most of which are in the Gulf of Mexico.